Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Denied podcast. I'm the host of the episode, Joe Carson, and it's really a great pleasure to be here with you today. And I've got a fantastic, awesome guest, somebody who I've seen a few times speaking, and his talks are always impressive. So I'd like to welcome uh, this special guest to the show, uh, known as Sick Codes, and uh, sometimes referred to as Casey once in a while, I guess doing some impersonation. Um, so over to you, Sick Codes, to kind of give us an introduction, who you are, what you do, and some of the things you, you enjoy. No worries, man. Thanks for having me on. Great to be here. Uh, yeah, I think we keep bumping into each other in Vegas and things like that. <laughs> you know, DEF CON just, just happened. Uh, my name's Sick Codes, Australian, obviously. You can probably tell from the accent. Uh, yeah, from, uh, I think I've been... In the recent years, I think I've done some pretty interesting stuff that you might have seen. You know, jailbroker John D. Tractor produced some research on a TCL TV that ended mm-hmm. up getting, well, practically banned from the United States, almost. <laughs> um, and a couple other things, like I think, uh, you know, just other random stuff. And always, you know, making sure research is taken care of in the in the domain because people like to get, you know, companies got those big hands and sometimes they mm-hmm. try to like, you know, yeah, they, they, try to, they try to push it aside. Um, and that's always kind of into the safe harbor side of things. You try to make yeah. sure that you're doing the vulnerability disclosure. And uh, it's always important to kind of have that two-way communication um, and, and a more kind of, you know, allowing the researchers to share their work and share, you know, because ultimately, you know, people like us, we, we want to make the world a safer place. And we're doing it and helping organizations find those, you know, high risk areas where, it, you know, we're showing the risks without taking, you know, let's say uh, maliciously. We're doing it in an ethical way and giving the opportunity to make sure that it's not maliciously attacked later, uh, which could cause them a lot more devastation, a lot more problems uh, than the way uh, that, uh, you know, security researchers are doing. So how, how did you get into this? What was what was your path? Can I, where did you start? <laughs> well, I won't get in too far back because there's a lot of crazy <laughs> stuff that happened back then. But, <clears throat> you know, in the last couple of years, I think I met Casey just through, you know, just working on stuff, contract stuff. And I eventually just sort of weaseled my way into sort of white hat behavior, if that makes sense. Anyway, and we started doing it some cool indeed. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a look at TCL. And TCL mm-hmm. televisions, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of them. Everyone's seen them. A couple of years ago, nobody had actually heard of them. And we basically, uh, me, I started myself. I went on my friend's, you know, team viewer. Mm-hmm. We're looking at his TV and we're like, well, hang on, what's all this stuff? Anyway, long story short, <laughs> um, Department of Homeland Security ended up actually basically saying that TCL is being looked at because of mm-hmm. the back doors that they allegedly put into their televisions. Mm-hmm. Um, the funny part about it is I called it, I didn't call it a back door. So I called it an extraordinary <laughs> vulnerability. And then, and basically through the press, like I think it was like a PC mag security ledger as well with Paul Roberts, who was mm-hmm. the subject of the talk the other day, B-sides as well on the panel. And um, yeah, basically they ended up getting uh, in big trouble, big, big trouble. And actually, funny story, they had just sold, I'm sure you're aware about mm-hmm. this, like this big huff and puff about Huawei and like TCL and Xiaomi mm-hmm. getting banned and sanctioned and they keep mm-hmm. swapping each other's products. So just before this happened, TCL had actually purchased the branded, uh, the honor phone of Huawei. And they were going to start <laughs> selling it in the United States. And uh, that was just before this happened. And then, mm-hmm. then I published research on them. They basically got smacked down as well. You know, it's like whack-a-mole. And sometimes mm-hmm. you got to take stock and figure it all out. So what's what's the process? What what method do you go about finding these vulnerabilities? You know, is, it, is do you have a process that you kind of you standardize on? You know, do you try to extract the firmware, or do you just basically monitor the communications? What what kind of what's the methodology you use? Well, I think I start. I usually start from like what sort of product am I looking at? Am I looking mm-hmm. at you know industry? Am I looking at you know <clears throat> critical infrastructure? Mm-hmm. Am I looking at something just random like an airplane? I got an airplane yeah. Wi-Fi. I'll show you <laughs> I didn't take it from the airplane myself, but <laughs> it was sold on eBay. Actually, that reminds me. I've got a voting machine a, right here. Oh, you have a voting I've machine. <laughs> I've got a voting machine right here. Fantastic. And I've just taken, I've started just taking it apart. And I want, cool. I don't want to, for the, for the, uh, for the headphone users only, yeah. I've got a, a massive we're, Votronic yeah, one here. We're sitting looking and at a voting machine for those who's just listening yeah, to the audio, which funny. is pretty cool. So what, and the what's funniest the, part about what, it. Some of the ports that you, yeah, the, are they all, Oh, they're all easy extractable as well. You can easily take them off. It's um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to explain it other than can I say the SHIT or not? Absolutely, yeah. It it's can a be. fucking shit show, man. It is a <laughs> shit show. <laughs> like, look at the CPU. It's an Intel Altera i three eighty six, old school, right? You it's really, these little chips yeah. here with the. With, this is the um the 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 vote count count mm-hmm. or something, and it's two megabytes. And I'm thinking, oh, like, 
it's just a may- it's just a bit of mayhem. But you know, I'm just having fun. I bought it like two years ago, and I thought I'd just have a crack at it yeah. off eBay. A lot of stuff from eBay. Yeah, so, eBay, but- eBay, eBay is our friend in regards yeah. to getting getting access to. And the worst thing, some of the things is that when you buy some of the things, is that you ultimately they're reused. Uh, which means totally. sometimes you can actually find a lot of uh, sensitive information yes. on a lot of this equipment as well. It's because, you know, it's not that you're buying a brand new and they've never been used. It's you're getting it from basically someone who's basically decided that we, we've got sitting in the storage, let's get rid of it. Let's just put it on the main bay and see if we can make some money back from it. But they never go through the proper process of actually erasing or getting rid of even some of the stuff in the memory or even the disk or, or, or storage. Um, and you can easily get a lot of quite of interesting information from them. Sometimes it's actually impossible to uh, get rid of the data because they haven't actually implemented some sort of, you know, bleach bit level stuff. Yeah. But if you look at, um, if you look on AliExpress and things like that, you can buy secondhand chips that have been, you know, they're out of mm-hmm. out of print, so to say. They're not yeah. in production anymore, and those chips have been literally cut out of a PCB, and you can see them online, mm-hmm. and they're literally the secondhand. All the data's on them. You don't know what you're going to mm-hmm. get. Sometimes it's a phone. Sometimes it's an old Samsung unencrypted with all their contacts and. <laughs> Cookies and whatnot, you know. Sometimes you get um, you get these cool things like John Deere tractors. You know? yeah. <laughs> that's, that's pretty awesome. So, what, what? So, the John Deere one is always an interesting one because you always get them. Um, so you 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 got to play Doom. <laughs> yeah. So John last Deere year, <laughs> totally. I think I think so. The, the long and the short is last year a gentleman named Paul Roberts who got the idea from someone else um, who's a big right to repair advocate, which is a big Others, issue at the moment. Yeah. It is a, yep, it's a massive a issue. I, I'm I'm happy with the direction it's going because it has been a pain for a long time. Um, yes. And, and it, it also is, you know, get into a lot of that, you know, the uh, acceptable rights and, and software, software bill of materials, all of that needs to be pretty much redone in order to make sure that we have the right to refer. Yeah, if you look at the the last, uh, I think last month, Paul mm-hmm. and a couple of fellas, uh, uh, Kyle Weins from iFixit, they went on the House Judiciary Committee mm-hmm. for Cyber Incident yep. or Copyright or something. Some of the people on the panel, well, Daryl Issa, who's the chair of the committee, um, yeah, they were there when they wrote the DMCA. That's how, that's how long yep. that uh, that experience has been. And so, obviously, in, in that time, they had no idea that they would be used for this sort of purpose. It was supposed mm-hmm. to be for like, you know, burning DVDs and stealing. You know, there's Sony yep. discs where they wiggle around and there's fake. They, they did some <laughs> sort of encryption with the data or whatever they did that somebody's cracked 20 years later. Um, but yeah, like there's just there's so many. Things that, that have gone wrong, I think, in that sort of vertical, particularly mm-hmm. when it comes to like products that are end of life. So, like, you know, you, you say that that John Deere right awesome. there, you know, yeah, that John Deere tractor that I put mm-hmm. on eBay and I jailbroke and I put Doom on it. And as everyone knows, Doom is the greatest game to run on a <laughs> jailbroken device because it proves it proves that you can do anything with it. Because if I can run Doom, I can mm-hmm. open web browsers, I can install malware, I can delete account data, I can uh, get things mm-hmm. for free. You know, for example, with the John Deere one. Um, John Deere knows full well that there's a lot of stuff that they pay, like packages, subscriptions, mm-hmm. and things, and I've got full access to it. So, yep. <clears throat> which I don't publish because I don't really want to get in big trouble. But uh, not that I would get in trouble because what I'm doing is fully in good faith. But mm-hmm. that's sort of that that little fine yeah, line. Yeah, so it's the, it's yeah. the intention, and and, and, right. and that's one. Of, we had a big discussion. Um, I, I was actually with EFF uh, when I was in um, uh, in Vegas. Uh, and we, I had a big discussion around uh, that. They said that what they would like, at least that part of the motivation side, is that you have to prove malicious intent. Not that you have to prove actually were, your your motive was actually for good intentions. Is that you actually have to do the reverse because that's the right way. Is you have the you know the, if your intention um, is not malicious, then you shouldn't already be you know <laughs> trying to get out of the the uh, right. application rather than trying yeah, to get guilty, guilty until guilty right. until proven innocent right and that's so. the way I think so a couple of years ago with the the, the Department of Justice and they mm-hmm. released a, the CFAA changes Computer Fraud and Abuse Act laws where they made it mm-hmm. so that you have to be they won't take any charges unless the person was acting in bad faith uh, in yeah. bad yeah if they're acting in good faith. Basically, don't don't yeah. approach and and, and you have to prove that. it. That was the they had to prove the malicious intent, and yeah. that's that's the key part. So, what question? What, when you were, when you're actually doing, all, um, you know, you know, putting Doom on, on what what are you yeah. what tools are you using? Because <laughs> um, one of the things well, you, you end up you end up getting ready to go make you end up going and making me purchase. Um, I, I, I the, guys, yeah. the guy that made it, it's Joe. It's Joe Fitz uh, Fitz something. I can't remember his name, but it's a legend. I know the guy really well. Um, if I don't forget his name, but Make the T-Guard, really good device. It's got everything and it's got Spy, I squared C, it's yeah. got A-Tag, I believe so. 
it's got everything you need to sort of just mm-hmm. jump in there. You need a couple other little tools. I've got a good one. I like it. I like this one called the RT eight hundred nine F, and I should have one in mm-hmm. one of the boxes. Yeah, I've got a lot more stuff. It's not in the not in the rack yet because I've got probably <laughs> I need probably six or seven more racks to put it all in. Um, but yeah, like there's just I think a sm- small amount of tools that need to be used mm-hmm. to do damage. And in fact, in this case, with the John Deere, all I did was basically open it all up. Take out the hard drive per se, which mm-hmm. is a little bit more complicated because I you can watch yep. the DEF code, it's quite in depth. Yep. In fact, I show a lot of videos. Yeah, we'll make sure to actually we'll put the, in, in the show notes, we'll we'll link out sure. the DEF code talk for sure. Yeah, it's a long talk and you might get yeah. bored if it's super <laughs> technical. Um, but the end's pretty funny with the Doom stuff. So basically I I, I took a Fedora version of Doom, Fedora being the mm-hmm. you know, the fork of Red Hat. Uh, yep. it's like a free version of Red Hat, um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is an expensive version of Linux with all the bells and whistles and support and, and FIPS 120 or whatever the stuff is. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's it's like I took one of those out, out and I put it on the device. It's very it's a very unique device. I think it's IMX6 NXP, I think is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And basically an old chip, 2016. And, you know, just kept trying and trying and trying until I get, got it done. And one thing that I couldn't get done was GZ Doom. And if anyone's done Doom before, they might know the graphics. Mm-hmm. Like the old Doom where it's 2D and you just go left and right. And then there's yeah. like the... You know, the, the normal, the now doom, which is like you can look up and down and stuff like that. You can shoot mm-hmm. in different directions. But the one that I had on there, you know, it's obviously John Deere tractor. It's not going to have a very powerful GPU, if at all. Um, so we, we, had, we had to make do. We had to make do with the downgraded version of Doom, which mm-hmm. was fine. But um, I had a different version of Doom ready to go. And actually, we modded, modded the Doom. I uh, mean, and a, and a, and a um, another modder named Skelligan from New Zealand mm-hmm. who helped me do the mod in the last couple of days. We had a mod, but it was for GZ right. Doom. And then <laughs> I, had to, I had to migrate it down to Chocolate Doom, which got rid of all the cool stuff. Like, anyway, um, yeah, it's like, and the impact, okay, the impact mm-hmm. of that. Playing Doom on a John Deere tractor is basically like saying to John Deere, I've got the keys to the kingdom. I know exactly yeah. how the products work. Um you know, here's a presentation about it. I actually didn't tell them that I was going to run Doom on it beforehand because mm. yeah, it would ruin the surprise, which is sometimes, <laughs> sometimes as you know, in, in bug bounty or in any yeah. sort of research, if you sometimes do that, you can get in trouble, you know, if you do the wrong thing or, you know, but in my case, I thought to myself, I'm not producing any zero days on stage. Yes. I'm showing the result, you know, like it's, I'm not releasing the POC or the exploit. I'm showing like how I did it. Physically, um, to to an extent. I mean, if you mm-hmm. follow track, if you follow it through, you can probably do it. But um, yeah, from that, it just exploded, obviously, and then it made mm-hmm. a big impact on the right to repair argument about you know, well, where does the software part end, and where does the you know the physical end of it yeah. and stuff like yeah. that? And it gets a bit especially complicated. especially to a point. A lot of things when you get an end of life end of life hardware. And oh. maybe you want to, you know, rep- you know, make it more updated. You want to, you know, fix some of the vulnerabilities yourself. A lot of times, yes. what I'm using, what I'm using a lot of uh, things like Bus Blaster, uh, Bus Prior Four, is typically repairing stuff. I may have bricked, uh, you know, doing a flashing of firmware, uh, yeah. and it bricked it because maybe I basically, you know, chose the wrong firmware at some point when I was doing oh, a flashing wrong or chip. Uh, wrong chip, or maybe basically the cable wasn't connected properly, and you, you know, you get a surge or the cable comes out and, and fails you in the par. Um, so a lot of times, what I'm doing is mostly to repair things. And I'm absolutely right that the right to repair is definitely one of the main motivations for a lot of these, especially for old hardware that yes. all of a sudden the manufacturer is no longer supporting. And that's getting more frequent um, where it used to be that you didn't have to worry about that because it was very little things you could do with the hardware. But now yeah. the hardware is becoming more smarter, um, lots more chips, a lot more connectivity. And it does mean that you have to really have to consider about, you know, what is implications of this for using it beyond uh, you know, the, let's say this the software support because the hardware should last a lot longer, and it gets into oh, also the, the recycle issue as well. Is that we you know recycling becomes a big part of this problem as well. Is if you can't recycle it, then it just becomes you know a, a massive uh, you know the, the the garbage pit pile as well. Totally. Think about how many people go out and buy you know Game Boys and things like mm-hmm. that from the from the, the old version. If somebody hasn't been able to repair that, it's just waste. Yep. And like, I get the whole point of it. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's a point to it and there's, you know, turnover of, mm-hmm. of life cycle of products, but there should be a limit in terms of like, you know, there should be some sort of limit about like, you know, okay, the device is finished because the manufacturer currently has both the, 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 the trademark or the patent on whatever they're doing, which is fine. I'm, I'm okay. I understand mm-hmm. all that. It's, you know, ingenuity and things like that. Yep. But there's a part where it's like, well, they have, they have both parts. They have the part where they, where they where they can look after the product and the part where they mm-hmm. can dump the product and then it's mm-hmm. like I get that but if I'm buying it and I'm not being I'm not fully aware mm-hmm. that it's going to be dumped eventually like yeah. absolutely dumped from the market is that is that something that 
should be the customer aware? Is it even like logical? You know, like if yeah. you think about an old product like a television, you, mm-hmm. know, you can repair most of it, if not all of it. Yeah. But things that are deliberately made to not work in in terms of uh, especially when, you know, as, especially when there's this control by software and software, yes, they, they decide cool. to switch that off. I've had a lot of. Uh, you know, even old uh, hardware devices where the vendor has literally just kept the web service going yes. just to to provide longevity of that. Um, you know, even I think it was, uh, the Universal yeah. Logitech Harmony remotes. There's a server that's literally just running, uh, and the, sometimes if it's not running, you might not get the configuration. But they're just keeping the it running. The television. Yeah, the room, Universal remote. There's a there's a service that they have a server, even though it's been end of life now for a number of years. They just have to keep that web service going to provide wow. the download configurations because that's you know ultimately and, and they're doing it. Um, so there's some vendors that will you know provide that and make sure you at least you're not breaking uh, the devices. Um, and that's something that you know is is you know it, consumers and people should know about them. One of the things I get worried about mostly is that now a lot of the EULAs when you when you, you know, turn on the TVs or you get the devices that EULA at the, at the beginning is saying that yes I I, I own the hardware. Um, and maybe the software, but actually the data now being generated is no longer, you don't own it and you have to actually hand it over. And that's part of that, you know, whole data, the communications and you're uploading it to, to numerous servers. Um, what's, what's your thoughts around that? Well, I think they had a really good point at the, the house committee the other day when, when um, Paul went on, uh, on the passenger committee in front of like, you know, the world in front of the Congress. Mm-hmm. And they asked. Uh, they they brought up an example. I think it was Laura Lofgren or one of the one of the um, senator, uh, one of the members there. Mm-hmm. And they were saying that um, they had a, some old study where they put terms and conditions on the last page. That had you know, if you read this, you get a thousand dollars, and nobody. Yeah. I remember that one. I remember that one. Yeah. That was- <laughs> so it's like it just it's in it's in there. Like who's going to read ninety six pages of stuff beforehand? And whether or not that's legal, that's mm-hmm. fine. That's not related. But yeah. you know, a customer should be able to. Yeah, the words is repair. Like, should be able to look after their own product, mm-hmm. especially after the product lifetime gone, and especially in terms of security. Because, mm-hmm. for example, the previous version of the John Deere display here is actually end of life Windows CE six, and it's still <laughs> the literal workhorse of the industry. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's, there's, you know, there's a couple, maybe I don't know, fifty, hundred thousand. You'll have to ask John Deere; they know the stats. They like, <laughs> back everyone. But there's a lot of the previous version, which is Windows CE, which is like. Yeah. <laughs> which is like totally end of life, you know, and then 2016 and then end of end of end of life yeah. was like 2022, which is last and year. And they're going to still use them until those things fall apart. Well, because that's, that's, <laughs> because yeah. I've got, we have a country house here in Estonia and yeah. we've got, I think it's three tractors right now on the, in the country house. Wow. And those things, you know, the, the oldest tractor we have is from the 1960s. And it's so, still running, and it's still running, and we're still <laughs> pushing it. Yeah. Um, and, and, it you, you want, and it works fine. It, it doesn't mean okay. It hits a few rocks. You have to replace it. Yeah. You have to, you know, do some welding and stuff. But it still works. And that's what you know. You're going to get people using them as long as they possibly can uh, because they're they're, they're expensive, uh, yeah. and and you want to keep you know you want to keep using it to get the value out of it. Um, so the, so the length of the time, absolutely, uh, for a lot of those devices, is going to be well beyond when the vendor stops supporting it. Yeah, and I think we, we've had a brainstorm, me and Paul, who's obviously very, very, he's got he's the founder of Secure Repair. Mm-hmm. You know, at the start, I was very iffy on the issue. I thought, you know, right to repair, it seems kind of, you know, communist. It's sort of like, you know, everyone's software is mine. I'm mm-hmm. like thinking to myself, okay, so how do I, how does this make sense in terms of security and versus blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, well, the, the problem there is the software locks, like the mm-hmm. iPhone, for example. They're designed in a way, well, they were designed so that you can't use one iPhone screen. If you go to the Apple store, Mm-hmm. And buy two yeah. iPhones or two products, regardless of what they are. I'm not going to say iPhones, mm-hmm. but they are. And you take the screens off and you swap the screens for each phone, and then it should work, obviously. Two yep. genuine products, original products. Problem is, the manufacturer is obviously relying on, they're, they're obviously worried about counterfeit products who come in and just mm-hmm. they do the same thing, they match up. And then, and then Apple does allegedly some type of like color diffusion or something like that. They make mm-hmm. it duller or something. But, but it's like that should work. People expect that to happen. And I think mm-hmm. what they've done in this case is, maybe a bit too trigger happy and, and they've said, okay, well, mm-hmm. you know, let's do that. And, and if you, I'll give you an example. So John Deere, they actually, you know, write a, they wrote an MOU about a couple of months ago and they said, look, we're going to comply to some stuff. We're going to make some sort of agreement. And they said, okay, we're going to give the dealer software out now to customers. Mm-hmm. They did that and they released a special uh, RS-2485 tool or whatever it is that connects to the tractor is now available without a dealership 
you know, contracts. Mm-hmm. So you can actually buy it on their website. It's expensive, two or three thousand dollars. We get all the manuals, seven hundred gigabytes of manuals, by the way. Mm-hmm. We've got deer construction, <laughs> forestry, we've got deer, uh, deer, yeah, deer agriculture, ag uh, construction and forestry, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and like there's yeah, you know, thousands, like a lot of manuals. Okay, a lot of mm-hmm. manuals, a lot of data. And that stuff wasn't previously available to the customer. You know, you had to go through yeah. a dealership and all sorts of like, you know. And Agreed even that deal is. alone, that deal alone, that that contract that they said we're going to sign and do this stuff, that alone is sort of like the evidence that there is a lock. There is sort of a, a ecosystem of like you have to stay here. You have, we control the product, and I think people, customer, I think manufacturers need to sort of just chill out a bit. You know, like I get the market shares competitive yeah. and all this stuff, and the shareholders want control and data and AI and all this crap. Mm. But at the end of the day, if the customer is getting really furious, they're, just, they're going to leave anyway. So like, why would yeah. you treat them like infants when they're, yeah. when they're, when they know what they're doing, there's smart people out there mm. deal with the counterfeit products with lawsuits or go to China and take the factories down. Like yeah. don't do it in, don't, don't do it through you, imports, you know? Yeah. So a question, what, what's some of the, what's some of the most common types of vulnerabilities or, or, you know, kind of bad practices that you do find? What would be the most common yeah. things? So do you find a lot of keys, hard coded yeah. passwords? Um, you know, what what's what types of things do you find when you, when you're going through? Well, typically um, with with hardware stuff, it's kind of like it's it's like the operating system. It's a fully unlocked computer. You've got everything. You've got all the you know, config files. You've got mm-hmm. everything. You've got all the file permissions, the file dates, and times, access, all that stuff. All the keys. You know, you've got all the private keys that connect mm-hmm. to the server. Sometimes they're for every product on the market for that. Sometimes they're for every, say, for example, I found a key on the John Deere uh, mm-hmm. of some description. I'm yeah. not going to say what it is. It was a key. And I asked John Deere, is this key on every single tractor? Or is it okay. this, re- is it my re- Reused. You know, yep. This is my rifle, right? Um, and they were like, oh, we'll send it. And they, they, they said, oh, no, it's just yours. And I'm like, okay, whatever. But anyway, there's, you know, there's sometimes there's like a big key or like, you, know, you get a lot of private certificates. Even the other day, I was looking at Huawei uh, solar inverters. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found, you know, the private key to their Tomcat client response whatever it is so yeah. some sort of api that sends their data back and basically you know i dump the firmware i'm just reading through it in the text file because i don't have the high silicon mm-hmm. ghidra decompiling all that crap but, um basically just looking at it through a text file just dumping mm-hmm. the entire uh, rom of the of the of the device and just yeah. scrolling through and what it does you know it goes like oh i've got function names i've got some sort of like mm-hmm. you know, some sort of log here and basically just figuring out whether or not it's a, it's a joke because sometimes with their small devices they've usually skimmed on security layers you know you've got you need a whole computer to run you know to beat zen bleed and all this stuff mm-hmm. but if you're on a tiny little esp32 it's like all of that stuff's out the window it's like tiny little you know things that can <laughs> destroy that you know one little thing just destroys it yeah um, i think i remember yeah. i remember one a few years ago where it was the one of the kind of first uh, vehicle companies you know car manufacturers to basically connect their car basically to a mobile app and they were end up uh using the vin number um as oh. the key so right. literally, if you if you just went to the car window and you looked at the VIN number, all of a sudden you could literally authenticate with the app uh, and be able to pull things like the you know the vehicle statistics, the yeah. log history, um, you know th- th- some of the kind of things that you end up you know going <laughs> really work. Okay. okay, it does take a physical. You know you can go check it physically. It, it does take some uh, element. Yeah, but you get a, you get to steal a car. <laughs> exactly. You can unlock. You can yeah. unlock and turn the lights on uh, of the vehicle. Totally. So um, yeah. those are things, some some of the things. I think. I think though, over the years, manufacturers are starting to learn and starting to bring more security researchers yeah. and security kind of knowledge into the business as well to make sure that they're thinking about these because to to repair it later is mm-hmm. way more expensive than to think of these things up front. Yeah, and if you look at the example of like, I think John Deere as an outlier, well, agriculture is sort of an outlier. You know, th- you think ag mining is doing okay because they have really good app, ISAC, yep. you know, Rob mm-hmm. Labby, and I think uh, Sh- Cheryl Serene. Um, they have a really good ISAC, you know, they look after them and they're all in the mm-hmm. same club, you know what I mean? And they, they actually think mm-hmm. about things, brainstorm. Whereas, you know, ag didn't, doesn't have an ISAC, it doesn't have, like information security exchange center where you're but you basically exchange vulnerabilities that you're facing, you know, say Rio Tinto mm-hmm. mining company, or yep. say John Deere is experiencing this, Caterpillar is getting thumped with this, or they're getting some sort of malware, ransomware, and they circulate it sometimes yep. anonymously to each other. So they can say that, like, we're on the same level, you know, um, team, and that's it. But, like, Ag doesn't have that. Ag's coming from mm-hmm. the literal outback. We call it the mm-hmm. outback, I think. Yeah. <laughs> the Americans call it the, the, the stick, so I don't know what they call it. Um <laughs> The country, the country, that's right, the country. <laughs> the, back, <Yeah>. the backwoods. 
But if you think like it's it's such a it's such a it seems like such a non-connected industry, mm-hmm. but it really is. And only in the last five six years, you know, they've gone mm-hmm. like the and the amount of data, and of course, as you know, absolutely, the AI yeah. can. Play. The AI component is fascinating for agriculture yeah. because yeah. even for re- repairs, I've seen it in the you know the mining industry where they're basically checking yeah. pipes uh, with drones for repairs and re- yeah. you know shipping. Um, I did a lot of work in the shipping industry, you know, and they're right. basically rather than sending people and divers, they, they have drones that goes and does everything for them these days. Because um, ultimately, I think in these industries, uh, the priority is the health and safety of the people working in them. Yes. And the more we can take them away from the dangerous types of activities, the safer it becomes. Uh, yeah. And that's ultimately, you know, what we're we getting to. Think about oil rigs. I mean, mm-hmm. as you're in the in the shipping and stuff, you would have obviously, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, the same sort of industry, maritime or whatever. But if you think aviation, like a lot of these industries, people sort of like, oh, you know, there's not much going on there. But mm-hmm. the kind of is, you know, like think yep. about when you when you get on a plane now, there's Wi-Fi everywhere. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's, a yeah. Mayhem. it's like a mayhem, you know, like. Yeah. Connect, Wi-Fi, connections, like, yeah, oh, connections but, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, let's go to Starlink. Just beaming up to Starlink, just like you're on the ground. It's like someone's router and everyone's on the well, same especially, yeah, especially when you get into satellites, K-band and L-band, then it gets into, right. the, it's the bandwidth. <laughs> so you've got so right. much limited bandwidth that, right. you know, securing it, you know, ultimately sometimes is impossible. Um, yeah. it might, it might, when you get into those types of communications, it really comes down to whoever has the biggest antenna and the most power is typically the winner. Uh, which typically gets into when you're talking about somebody who's very resourceful or government in fact uh, that's where right. they get into those capabilities so uh, but it is it is you know the communication size becomes very very tricky what question what what for anyone who you know in the audience who's looking to get into hardware hacking or get, getting kind of kind of where to get started what would be some of the good resources or could direction that you would you know point them in i think um you know look up some tools i did, I did a talk at microsoft's blue hat last year called advanced hardware hacking it's mm-hmm. on YouTube. Um, it's a pretty decent introduction. It's kind of like a bit of, you know, you watch it twice through and you might get it. Okay. But I think I think other than that, um, you know, there's good guys like Colin O'Flynn. He's got a book out called mm-hmm. Adva- a Hardware Hacking Handbook, I believe, through um, No Starch Press. That's pretty yep. good. No Starch. So we, had, we had Bill Pollock on a few weeks ago. Um, right, right. Bill, Pollock, if Bill Pollock is amazing. He's such totally, a good totally, And totally. No Starch definitely has by far, for me, you know, yes. some of the best cybersecurity books out there. Yeah, quality, they are, yeah, pristine quality. And I think, yeah, another one out there, yeah, Joe Grand obviously has. You know, Joe Grand has this, yeah. I've always, I, I was registered for his course uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah. I wanted to go on it. And uh, it was basically right when COVID started. Which right. meant, and it was canceled. So um, ultimately, I missed that chance. Uh, but I've always kind well, of. I just saw him, I just saw him last week. You just saw him, the, the kingpin and himself. He did training and we, he, he did a talk. Missed his talk because it was nine o'clock in the morning. Mom was straight after. I just wanted to prepare mm-hmm. for it, but we did see the Gruck. And I oh, think the Gruck. Said, yeah, the yeah. Gruck on. yeah, yeah. We did yeah, have the Gruck, the Gruck on a few, a few, uh, a couple of months ago. We were talking about OSINT. When when OSINT is good and when it's bad, <laughs> when it's helpful right. and when it's not, uh, which is always really good. good. He had a really interesting talk that sort of jumped my mind. Like mm-hmm. it's about systems, and I don't want to spoil it because yeah. I think it comes out on YouTube in a bit. But it's pretty mm-hmm. good. It's about like. Anyway, it's it's interesting talk, uh, quite short, and we had a little bit of an AV issue, but he's a really good natural talker. It's quite he is he's fantastic. He's always it's yeah. always exciting. <laughs> But it's been, it's been fantastic having you on the episode and it's really kind of very insightful. And really what I'll make sure is that all the things we talked about, um, we'll put in the show notes so people can get easy access to the talk from uh, from DEF CON and also the Microsoft as well. Um, and any final words of wisdom you would like to share with the audience? What would you, what, was, what would you, for the, maybe the manufacturers out there that might be listening? In? You know what? You know what? I saw a book, I read a book the other day called Jonathan Levington Seagull or Jonathan Seagull Levington or something. Interesting book, interesting book. It's only like 20 pages it's 1970s go and read it it's something about like going out from the pack and sort of like doing your own thing and then coming back and everyone thinks you're different and you're doing something wrong and then you come back and you come up with disciples of you know and then i think about john Deere. like here i am in thailand thousands of miles away from from the u.s and then we all come to the to the defcon yep. and then anointed you know like everyone's coming there like a zombie and we do this massive hoorah and then everyone goes off to their little islands again yep. and i think I think that community thing, you know, connecting with people, even if it's your GitHub or mm-hmm. Discord or Telegram or Element or Matrix, whatever, yep. just keep and Twitter, obviously, and, and then yeah, just keep like connecting with other hackers, reach out to people. People are obviously very friendly. Absolutely, um, you know, we, yeah, totally friendly, especially in the hacker community because they learn mm-hmm. from someone else. Um, I think just reach out to people, DM them, email mm-hmm. them. I emailed Joe one day and was like, "Hey, dude," and then <laughs> bang, we're, we're in a Zoom. You know, fantastic. Um, yeah. 
Oh, definitely. For the audience, you know, one of the things is is get connected with the community. There's a lot of great totally. people out there and they're all willing to, to give a helping hand and share. So many thanks, Sick Codes. It's been awesome having you on. It's always great to catch up. And I'm pretty sure we, we, we've been passing each other at different events. I'm sure there'll be another one soon. Uh, so for the yeah. audience, uh, definitely, you know, sync up, uh, check out Sick, Sick Codes, uh, you know, content and resource. It's amazing. Uh, stay safe. Check in every two weeks for the uh, 401 Access Denied podcast. And uh, look forward to you, you know, having and chatting with you again in the future. So thanks, everyone. All the best and take care.